Hello. Today we're going to be talking about the equations of state, which is essentially the ideal gas law. The types of variables that we use in the ideal gas law can either be intensive or extensive. Intensive variables are those variables that do not depend upon the amount of mass that is present. The extensive variables do depend upon the amount of mass that is present. And examples of intensive variables include pressure, density, temperature, the molecular weight. The variables that do depend on mass are volume and the number of moles in. And as you can imagine, in the atmosphere, when we start talking about air parcels, the size of an air parcel is not well defined. It can be something very small, it can be something very large. And we don't want our equation of state to be dependent upon the size of the air parcel that we choose. Therefore, we like to rearrange the equation of the ideal gas law to turn it into an equation that is based more on intensive properties than extensive ones. So if you think back to the ideal gas law that you have in chemistry, um, it's pressure times volume is equal to the number of moles times the universal gas constant R star times temperature. And pressure is going to be in units of pascals. The volume is in cubic meters. The number of moles is simply number of moles. And the universal gas constant is 8.3143 joules per kilogram, excuse me, joules per uh, degree Kelvin per mole. And the temperature, of course, has to be in degrees Kelvin. As you can tell from this equation, um, it has two extensive variables and two intensive variables. The intensive variables are pressure and temperature, and the extensive variables are volume and the number of moles. So in order to transform this equation that depends upon the amount of mass that's present in our air parcel, we're going to divide the uh, two extensive variables by mass in order to convert this to a mass-independent equation. And if we divide the volume by mass and the number of moles by mass, then we can actually do that. And we come up with a new equation that pressure times alpha, where alpha is the specific volume, which is essentially the inverse density. It has units of kilograms per meter cubed, excuse me, meter cubed per kilogram. And then we have R star, which is now divided by the molecular weight because the molecular weight is kilograms per mole, and that's essentially what we had here uh, in the inverse of the molecular weight in terms of moles per kilogram. And then, of course, we have temperature. So P alpha is equal to R star over the molecular weight times the temperature. <clears throat> and we'll redefine this R star over molecular weight and instead of being the universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight of your gas, we're going to redefine that as the specific gas constant for a gas of molecular weight M. And so our equation in the intensive form becomes pressure times the specific volume is equal to the specific gas constant for a gas with molecular weight M uh, times temperature. If we look at the specific gas constant for the atmosphere, we need to know the molecular weight of the atmosphere. And the atmosphere can be divided up into its constituent components. For example, we can talk about the molecular weight of the dry atmosphere. We can talk about the molecular weight of the water vapor components of the atmosphere. Or we could talk about the molecular weight of the moist air. And by using the term moist air, that refers to an atmosphere that includes both the dry constituents and water vapor. <clears throat> so in doing so, we're going to be defining the specific gas constant for dry air as the universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight for dry air. We're going to define a specific gas constant for water vapor as the universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight for the vapor. And for moist air, 
Uh, we're going to define that as the specific gas of the specific gas constant for the mixture, which is going to be the, the universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight of the mixture. So in order to answer this question of what is the specific gas constant for the atmosphere, we need to be able to calculate the molecular weight of the dry air, the molecular weight of the vapor, and the molecular weight of the mixture. So the molecular weight of the dry air is simply a weighted average of the constituents. So for example, we know that nitrogen makes up 78.08% of the atmosphere uh, by volume. So we're going to multiply that uh, quantity by the molecular weight of nitrogen. And then we'll do the same thing for the molecular weight of oxygen, what makes up 20.95% of the atmosphere, and then also for argon. And if you use the exact specific, uh, the exact molecular weights of these species, uh, you will then be able to calculate the molecular weight of the uh, dry air as 28.97 grams per mole. If we do the conversion from grams to mole to kilograms per mole, it's 0 0.02897. And you should be able to do that calculation as an exercise. The molecular weight of the water vapor is much simpler because you're simply talking about the molecular weight of a given molecule. Uh, in this case, 16 for the oxygen and one each for the hydrogen, uh, resulting in 18 grams per mole or 0.018 kilograms per mole. <clears throat> the molecular weight of the mixture is more complex. The way that we like to do this is to describe the molecular weight of the mixture as being the molecular weight of the dry air times a, convert, a, a correction factor that depends upon how much water vapor is actually in the air. And this correction factor is 1 plus W, where W is defined as the mixing ratio. And it's the mass of the vapor divided by the mass of dry air. So it's a ratio of water vapor to uh, dry air in the atmosphere. And so the molecular weight of the mixture is the molecular weight of the dry times 1 plus the mixing ratio divided by 1 plus the mixing ratio divided by epsilon. And epsilon for this case is 0 0.622. I could derive where this comes from but I'd rather spend my time focusing in on the application of this equation. Uh, for the derivation, you can look at the Wallace and Hobbes textbook, and he does a, a more thorough job of figuring out where this actually comes from. So if we use the molecular weight for the dry air and plug that into this equation over here, we end up with this specific gas constant for dry air being equal to 287 joules per degree Kelvin per kilogram. If we do that for the molecular weight of the vapor, then we'll end up with the 461 joules per Kelvin per kilogram. And for the moist air, it's going to be variable, depending upon the amount of water vapor that's actually present in the atmosphere, which is denoted by the mixing ratio. And we'll come back to that equation shortly. So to summarize where we're at, we have equations of state for dry air in the intensive form that is mass independent. And the equation for that, for dry air, is the pressure of the dry air times the specific volume of the dry air is equal to the specific gas constant for the dry air times temperature. Likewise for water vapor, we have the pressure of the water vapor component times the specific volume of the water vapor component equals the specific gas constant for water vapor times temperature. And in atmospheric sciences, we like to redefine terms that could be confusing. And this P with the subscript V could easily be confused with PV from over here on the ideal gas law. So we want to redefine this pressure of the vapor using a different symbol, and the symbol that we use in atmospheric sciences is actually E. So when I see E, that tells me that's the vapor pressure caused by water vapor. 
and the form of the equation that we actually use is E times the specific volume of water vapor is equal to the specific gas constant for water vapor times temperature. And then for the moist air, which is the combination of the dry air and the water vapor, we use Dalton's law of partial pressure to say that the total pressure is equal to the pressure of the dry components plus the pressure of the water vapor component. Um, and we could theoretically take these equations and substitute in, but what we prefer to do is instead to say that the pressure of the total pressure of all of these constituents is equal to the specific volume of the mixture times the specific gas constants of the mixture times temperature. But unfortunately, the mixture changes from one location to another and from time to time. So we have developed an alternative way to describe that to simplify the calculation. And that is signified by this equation up here, which is the total pressure is equal to the specific volume of the mixture times the specific gas constant for the dry air times this temperature that has been redefined. It's now the virtual temperature. And the virtual temperature is defined as the temperature uh, of which an air parcel will have the same, the temperature that a moist air parcel would have to have in order to have the same density as a dry air parcel. I think I got that backwards. It's the density that a dry air parcel would have to have in order to match the specific volume of the mixture. And we'll come back to that. <clears throat> so we've actually redefined temperature, which allows us to use a specific, single specific gas constant. And this virtual temperature is equal to the actual temperature plus a, uh, times a correction factor. And that correction factor is one plus the mixing ratio divided by epsilon divided by 1 plus epsilon. And we could do some rearranging of this uh, equation to get it into a way that is completely dependent upon intensive variables. And that is the virtual temperature is equal to the actual temperature times 1 over 1 minus the vapor pressure caused by the water vapor divided by the total pressure times 1 minus epsilon. And just to clarify, the virtual temperature is defined as the temperature that dry air must have in order to have the same density as the moist air at the same pressure. It was Sir Isaac Newton that actually was the first to understand that if you have two air parcels of the same temperature and pressure, and one is composed of dry air and the other is a moist air parcel, that those two air parcels will have different densities because the molecular weight of water vapor is less than the molecular weight of dry air. As a result, those two air parcels, the dry air parcel and the moist air parcel with the similar temperature and pressure will have different densities and the moist air parcel will actually be more buoyant than the dry air parcel. And that's one of the ways that we actually do this. The virtual temperature is a correction factor to account for that extra buoyancy. And the virtual temperature uh, correction is usually on the order of a few degrees. And we can say that the virtual temperature is always going to be greater than the actual temperature. The more humid it is, the larger the variation will be between the actual temperature and the virtual temperature.